So as Dana suggested, WTF is a phrase that we all use. It's pregnant with meaning. WTF can mean two things. It can be this expression of amazement light. So for example, today I bike here, you know, with a little, you know, thing in my ear. It was telling me turn by turn which street to turn on to to have a bike lane. Uh, a few years ago, that would have been, uh, you know, an occasion for amazement. Now we just take it for granted. And you think about that expression of amazement that we all have every day as a result of technology. But we're also ex experiencing the WTF of dismay, which is the other way that people use that expression. So there are a lot of people who are hearing, you know, warnings about how AI and robots are going to take their jobs. You know, here's a recent study from Oxford University that 47% of jobs are at risk of being automated in the next 20 years. You know, we have a lot of people in Silicon Valley talking about universal basic income. Not a bad idea at all, but as T.S. Eliot said, this last temptation is the greatest treason to do the right deed for the wrong reason. You know, it's not the right reason that there will be no work to go around. We have to understand, is there really nothing left for humans to do? You know, so people are increasingly unhappy and they're afraid about tech. And there's uh, begun a tech backlash. You know, the uh, you know, Occupy movement was targeted at Wall Street. Today's equivalent is increasingly targeted at tech. Uh, we've been there before. You know, everybody knows about the Luddite Rebellion of 1811, 1812. Uh, they probably don't know that Ned Ludd didn't actually exist. He was mythical even in 1811. But, and they also have come to identify uh, the, the weavers with this idea of uh, technological resistance. You know, we don't want change. And that's not what it was all about at all. The Luddites wanted a seat at the table. They wanted to be part of the conversation. And that's what we see today. And what we also see is that both the weavers and the mill owners had a massive failure of imagination. Neither the weavers nor the mill owners could imagine the bounty that came from that industrial revolution. They couldn't imagine that their descendants would have more clothing than the kings and queens of Europe in their day. They couldn't imagine that ordinary people would be eating fruit in the depths of winter. They couldn't imagine just this bounty that was produced by the Industrial Revolution. And they couldn't imagine that we'd build skyscrapers half a mile high, that we'd go into space, that we'd split the atom, that we'd dig a tunnel between England and France, uh, that we'd fly through the air, that we'd land on the moon, uh, that we would, in fact, increase the life expectancy of their grandchildren almost to double what their own life expectancy was. And it's kind of amazing. You look at that graph from Our World in Data, a wonderful resource about the way the world is getting better, and you see that about the middle of the 19th century, this graph, which had been bouncing along for centuries without going anywhere, suddenly goes up and to the right. And as additional countries industrialize, life expectancy goes up. That's a pretty compelling WTF of delight that technology and our market system has done something incredibly good. But it also has created this incredible uh, set of, of issues, just as it did in the 19th century. And so one of the things I've been asking myself is, what is our failure of imagination as we look towards the future and we think about the jobless future and we're feeding this fear and dismay about technology? And the thing that I think is driving dismay is this graph. And this is America. There's different versions of it in different places around the world. But basically, the dark blue line shows the productivity of our economy. And it keeps going up and to the right. That's the, tech, that's the celebra things that technologists like to celebrate. The light blue line is median family income, which starting around the mid to late 70s flattened out here in America. And that's what's created this disaffection, uh, the rise of populism, uh, the fear of, of progress and technology. And we have to understand what's causing that. And we're not asking the right questions. You know, we should be asking what work needs doing. We need to ask what, how work is changing. 
particularly, we have to ask, what does technology make possible today that was previously impossible? Okay, we, and we also really need to ask, how do we make the world more prosperous for everyone? And why aren't we doing it? Right? So we've started to hear a lot about this from the economists and financial writers. You know, Thomas Piketty's Capital in the 21st Century really, uh, you know, woke people up. Uh, you know, Duran Asimoglu's uh, Why Nations Fail, The Rise and Fall of, of States. Uh, you know, uh, on the financial side, Makers and Takers, uh, Rana Faruhar's amazing book about the, the rise of the financial industry and the way that it's sort of undermined uh, the rest of the economy. But I decided to talk about uh, these issues from the point of view of technology, right? And in a lot of ways, the book is a meditation on what the great technology platforms have to teach us all about the future of work, business, and the economy. And so the first thing that I really start with is this idea that our maps of the world can steer us wrong. This is a fabulous map from 1625. Uh, that shows that they believed that California was an island. And there's a fabled expedition in which a group of, uh, 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 of, of missionaries, Spanish missionaries, actually dragged a boat across the Mojave Desert so that they could cross the ocean that they expected to find on the other side. Uh, there was no ocean on the other side. And it, was, it actually took many, many years before they, they actually got the map right. So similarly, and this is coming up to uh, you know, the beginnings of my career, you know, in 1998, everybody thought that free software was the enemy of commercial software. Right? They thought, oh, this is the end. You know, there were statements like uh, Jim Malchin at Microsoft saying, uh, you know, open source is a cancer. Um, you know, it's going to destroy intellectual property. And in fact, what we all discovered was that open source software was the foundation of the next generation of computer applications, uh, that there were new sources of value that would be created and vast new empires built. Uh, you know, in 2005, this is what we thought the connected taxi cab looked like. You know, we just put a screen in the back, credit card reader, we showed people ads. It wasn't until a few years later that we realized that we could match people up in real time. You know, drivers and passengers using this magic that was already in the smartphones. So in 2017, when we think that technology will take all the jobs and leave humans nothing to do, I think this is also an example of what I call framing blindness, where we interpret the future in terms of the past, and where we don't think through what is possible today. So here's what I think is happening. Now, first of all, I say it's happening gradually, then suddenly. That's a, a wonderful phrase from Ernest Hemingway. Originally used it in one of his novels about bankruptcy. Character says, he asked, one character asks another, uh, how did you become bankrupt? And the guy says, two ways, gradually, then suddenly. And I think, you know, think about all of us who've been around technology, you know that's kind of how it happens. You know, you see these, uh, this slow accumulation of change, and then suddenly it snaps into focus. You know, and, and it's just, then we're living in a new world. And I think we have to remember that, you know, that, that there's this change that's happening all around us. And it's suddenly going to change into something rich and new. And that new, I think, is, is all tied up with the idea that the world is infused with the digital, that artificial intelligence and algorithmic systems are coming out of what we used to think of as the purely digital realm, entering the real world. And in that process, we're creating new kinds of partnerships between me machines and human beings. And here's what that looks like. This is an amazing graph that shows what happened to Amazon's employment when they added 45,000 robots to their warehouses between 2014 and the middle of 2016. They added 250,000 human workers. And the interesting question is why? We have been told this story that you automate in order to get rid of people. And Amazon did something different. They said, when we add robots to the warehouses, we're going to actually be able to pack in more products. We're going to be able to ship those products more quickly. We're going to be able to get those products to people, more, more products to people next day. We're going to have a whole lot of products we can start to get to people in some zip codes same day. 
right? And so by doing more, rather than simply saying we're going to cut costs, they actually increase the number of workers. And actually, I know from their talking with people who run their Amazon Flex service, which is on track to be, I was told, to be as big as Lyft in terms of the number of people driving for it. So that, you know, that there's also this huge delivery ecosystem. And Michael Mandel from the Progressive Policy Institute has actually studied the, the jobs that are being created. And despite a lot of the, the negative blowback, you know, I'm not saying that Amazon's perfect, uh, Mandel found that the jobs that are being created in warehouses actually pay better and have better working conditions than many of the jobs in retail that are being replaced. But more importantly, uh, this is all an example of what Jeff Bezos calls the flywheel. That is, uh, when you have greater selection, you have a better customer experience, you get more traffic, more sellers, lower cost structure, lower prices, it keeps going faster. And he spends all his time at Amazon trying to do more. And that really is the master uh, you know, design pattern, I think, of success in any economy, in any capitalist economy, certainly. But there's another point, and, and my friend Nick Hanauer, who is uh, actually the first non-family investor in Amazon, uh, he calls this the, the, uh, the first law of capitalism. And that is, when workers have more money, companies have more customers, and then hire more workers. Because, of course, it's a great cycle. And one of the things that uh, the industrialists of the early in, uh, uh, industrial revolution forgot, and that we're forgetting today, is you can't have consumers unless you have a way for those people to afford your products. And there may be better ways, you know, universal income might be one of them, than giving people jobs. Uh, but there are a lot of interesting tried and true solutions that we should be thinking about, reducing working hours, increasing pay, all kinds of things to keep that wonderful flywheel uh, of, of, of the economy going. I also think we need to think about moving away from our uh, consumption-based economy into new kinds of services, but there's a, there's a whole set of things to unpack there. But I also want to talk a little bit about the kinds of systems that we're building today in this world that's unfolding gradually, then suddenly. And the first idea that I want to get across is that the coming robots are not autonomous. You know, when you see that you know, vision of the self-driving car, you think of it as a thing. It's the robot you know, that, that acts intelligently on its own. It's really not. It's, a, it's part of a system. And that system includes people at all levels. It's a new kind of partnership between humans and machines. Uh, if it's you know, Waymo and you know, Google self-driving car, there are still, the self-driving uh, car is trained by human street view drivers who've already driven those streets with sensors and all that data is remembered. Uh, there's uh, people who are building them. Once we have fleets of self-driving cars, well, I think we'll actually build new kinds of services on top of using those uh, uh, self-driving vehicles. But I also think when you look at a system like Uber, you're gonna see a mix of human and machine. And it's super important to understand you know, that dispatch capability. It's not just the smartphone that does that. It's not just the GPS satellite that does that. It's the data center and the dispatch algorithms. And there's something really interesting there because those data centers are, again, managed by humans. There are people in them. Uh, fewer, not a lot of them on the physical level, but the people managing, directing those algorithms, building them, training them. Uh, and this is a new kind of partnership between human and machine. And this is a super interesting concept uh, from biology called symbiogenesis. Uh, Lynn Margulis in 1967 uh, kind of revived this idea, which was originally developed by some Russians uh, around 1915. And it really was the idea that multicellular life was actually a colony organism of, of, more, of simpler single uh, uh, cellular uh, organisms. And it turns out that the mitochondria and chloroplasts, the organelles inside complex cells, are actually have different DNA. This was eventually proven, different DNA than the cell nucleus. So effectively, we are made up as a colony of different kinds of organisms. And we know that also from the idea of the microbiome, that effectively uh, you know, we have more bacteria in our bodies than we have human cells, and they actually contribute to our functioning, they contribute to how we feel and how we think. And so I, I, I kind of like the idea of describing what's happening today as a kind of technological symbiogenesis. 
That is, we're building this new compound machine. You know, the AI is not separate from us. We are living in the AI. And you can understand this when you think about a system like Uber and Lyft. You can see that it's this complex organism, in some sense, of humans and machines. You can also see it when you think about Google or Facebook. You know, how our minds, what we think and what we learn, is shaped by these machines. We were having a great discussion today about the extent to which uh, you know, Facebook shapes what we believe, shapes how we act, it shaped our election, and of course it was shaped by humans, it shaped, uh, but the, it also shaped us. So we, we have this incredible inflection point of humans and machines, not, uh, uh, you know, where the augmentation is not of our muscles but of our minds, the changes in our minds. Now here's the thing, those algorithmic systems all have uh, what you could call an objective function. In the book, I actually call it a fitness function because I tie it to an idea from evolutionary programming, uh, or actually from, from evolutionary theory about fitness landscapes. But you could also call it an optimization function. So you think about Uber and Lyft, they try to get, uh, all of their systems are designed uh, to get passengers picked up in three minutes. You know, Google tries to get you to click on a result and have it be the, the, the right result the first time. Facebook tries to get you uh, content that you're gonna like and share and, and want to see more of. And turns out that scheduling systems used by companies like Walmart, The Gap, or McDonald's have as their objective function less reduced the number of hours that we use of human labor. Right? So we're te they're telling it, cut and get rid of the humans. So uh, one of the things I have to think about is, you know, are we telling our algorithms the right things? Because like the jinn of Arabian mythology, our digital genies do exactly what we tell them to do. And just like in the stories, if you don't phrase your wish just right, it goes a little haywire. You know, I, I don't know how many of you ever saw the movie Fantasia, uh, you know, in which, uh, you know, uh, Mickey uh, Mouse, the sorcerer's apprentice, you know, get, uh, uses a spell to make the broomsticks uh, help him with his chores, and they start multiplying and bringing more and more uh, uh, buckets of water and flooding his master's castle. Uh, that's the world that we are living in because we don't entirely understand uh, this world we're living in. And of course, one of the things we have to understand is that our financial markets are also one of these great, uh, you know, symbiotic systems of human and machine, right? That's the Equinix NY4 data center uh, it's, uh, over in New Jersey. It's where trillions of dollars from Wall Street change hands. Uh, and that's rel relatively indistinguishable from a Google or a Facebook data center. So, you know, we understand that when Mark Zuckerberg imagined that, that uh, building algorithms that would feed people more of the content they liked, uh, that would increase their community and their social connections. He didn't mean uh, to increase hyper-partisanship. He didn't mean to create all these negative effects that everybody's now struggling with. And Facebook is working very hard uh, to fix their algorithms to come to grips with this problem. But when you think about that NY4 data center and what's happening there, it tells us that we also have an objective function in our economy. And what is that? I like to make the case that it was designed starting in the 70s, uh, beginning with this uh, critical op-ed by Milton Friedman where he said the social responsibility of business is to increase its profits. And over the next decade, uh, particularly through the work of, a, of an economist named Michael Jensen, uh, this became the basis of what's now referred to as shareholder value thinking. The idea that the only obligation, in fact, the legal obligation of a company is to make money for its shareholders, and if it does anything else, it's actually uh, potentially legally liable. You know, you'll hear people kind of put that out. And think about the financial statements of a company. People are a cost. You know, the thing that we're trying to get to is what we call the bottom line. Right? The bottom line is more money. Now, that is actually the same kind of fitness function as uh, picking up passengers in three minutes, uh, getting people to click on a result. But we don't see it. We just sort of think, that's the way of the world. That's the way the world works. You know, this, we're so part of that market-based organism that we don't even see it anymore. And so 
I think the job that we have to do is to debug the rules of our economy. A friend of mine, Andrew Singer, uh, in the very early days of my career, uh, uh, I, I wrote a manual for him. Uh, it was for the first C compiler for the Macintosh. And uh, he, he had this statement that he uh, said. He said, the art of debugging is figuring out what you really told your program to do instead of what you thought you told it to do. And that's a lovely description because, you know, people mean well. They don't think that they're uh, trying to do evil, but sometimes we do it anyway. And we have to come to grips with the consequences of what we design. So my point is that it isn't technology that wants to eliminate jobs. That's what we are telling it to do. And I think we have to stop telling it to do that. And that's another lesson that I have from my life in technology. And that is that generosity triggers innovation. Uh, John von Neumann uh, and his team at the Institute for Advanced Studies during World War II developed the fundamental structure of computing that we use today. We talk about the von Neumann architecture. It was funded by the US government, and guess what? Because of that, it was put into the public domain. Everything uh, that followed depended on that. Uh, you know, in 1982 or 81, uh, you know, when IBM was behind in this new market they didn't think really mattered, the microcomputer market, they, they did this catch-up play, which was to build a, a computer out of commodity parts, uh, share the designs, Anybody could build them. They assumed that they would dominate the market. Don Estridge of IBM uh, kind of developed this strategy. Bang, you know, the PC market took off. Tim Berners-Lee put the um, uh, World Wide Web into the public domain. And each of these times, we saw this huge explosion of innovation and advances. So that's the first thing we learned from, from uh, computer, the computer industry. The second thing, is that over time, companies arise and they start to capture the value of that innovation. And then they often forget to keep the cycle going. And they start to capture too much of the value for themselves. And they effectively, they drive everyone away. You know, so Microsoft so thoroughly dominated the PC space that there was no opportunity left for developers. So they went over to the, to the web, uh, where at the time, nobody actually thought you could make any money. But they just thought, well, we can make cool stuff. And this is, a, this is a kind of a, a diagram of what they call a fitness landscape. Uh, it was actually adapted from you know, a, a biology text, and I just kind of drew it with, uh, with uh, data in it instead. You know, so there's this you know, migration. Or the, you know, the, the, you, you, it's e the point is that it's easier to get to a new peak often from the valley, so which is why we often see these ups and downs in, in the technology landscape. But the master pattern for escaping this is to remember to create more value than you capture, to build a long-lasting ecosystem. And I think that's, uh, uh, I guess, a key lesson. And I, I think there's a related way of framing this, which I got from a book called Who Gets What and Why. It's written by Alvin Roth, who got a, a Nobel Prize for his work on marketplaces. Now, the kind of marketplaces he was working on doing better designs for was uh, the matching marketplaces for kidney transplants. But the idea that advances in matching marketplaces uh, is a critical uh, um, next stage of the technology evolution, I think is super important to recognize. Uh, I was actually pointed to this book by the chief economist at Uber who said it was his Bible. You know, you think about Uber and Lyft are a new kind of matching marketplace, making it easier for people who want something to find it. You look at all of our e-commerce, that's a lot of what it's about. And I think that, uh, you know, uh, you know, you can think of Google and the web as an, a matching marketplace for knowledge. Uh, Airbnb, obviously, matching marketplace. And we have to start thinking about uh, all of the ways that this technology that we're building today will allow people to find new opportunities, to exploit them. There's, I think there's a beginning of an opportunity to completely rethink the way that we exchange goods and services with each other with the aid of these new machines. And so, uh, you know, kind of coming back to what does technology want, it wants us to use these capabilities to solve problems. Again, back to Nick Hanauer. He said, prosperity in human societies is best understood as the accumulation of solutions to human problems. We won't run out of work till we run out of problems. Now, are we done yet? Does anybody think we're done with solving the world's problems? I don't. I mean, I look around, you know, we've got to deal with climate change. We've got 
terrible infrastructure which we need to fix. We've got to feed the world, end disease, resettle refugees. You know, why is, you know, you know, Alphabet saying we should be building a new city for techies outside Toronto rather than saying, hey, let's go figure out what we could do to resettle the world's tens of millions of refugees. I guarantee you that solving the real problem is a far better business opportunity. We have to rethink, what does the caring economy look like? You know, I think in the world of the future, caring is this huge opportunity. And above all, we have to figure out how we could enjoy the fruits of shared prosperity. All this technology is making the world richer, and we're allocating it to a small number of people rather than continuing to say, let's make the world better for everyone. So I, I, I really loved um, this uh, idea from an essay that John Maynard Keynes wrote in 1929 called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. You know, we talked about what he called the true economic problem, which is how to use our freedom from pressing economic cares to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won for us to live wisely and agreeably and well. You know, living well, building a human-centered world is in fact within our grasp. We have this amazing set of superpowers that we can use to make a better world. And we have to look at the world around us and say, why aren't we doing that? Why are we accepting the world as it is? You know, why are we putting the screen in the back of the taxi cab when we could be saying, this could be done completely differently? So we are framing blindness about economic policy and politics, not just technology. You know, what would it take for us to put people to work tackling the world's greatest problems? What would it take for us to treat humans as assets, not liabilities? What would it take to create an economy based on caring and creativity? Let the machines focus on the repetitive tasks. What would it take for us to apply on-demand marketplace models to healthcare? You know, I imagine augmenting community health workers uh, with telemedicine and AI so we could all have house calls, not just rich people, right? Uh, I imagine giving everyone access to knowledge on demand. You know, I imagine having fresh approaches to public policy based on what's possible now and by learning what works in the way that we have learned to do in the tech industry by measurement and test, right? Rather than just picking from set political menu you know, full of failed policies that we're going to try again based on our team versus your team. So that's why the, the, the key line in the title is actually not WTF, but, you know, what's the future? It's up to us. Thank you. And now is the fun part where we got to get to ask some questions. I know, oh, there's our time. There we go. <laughs> hey, Tim, Day Thurston here. Yeah. Um, I'll try to keep it brief. It seems like you, ha you haven't, maybe you're doing the book, and I will buy it, to take the step to say that we need new rules. Part of what's missing, like it's not an accident, it was designed this way. Yeah. The wealth inequality was of tax policies as yeah. well, not Absolutely. just machinery. And the definition of marketplace seems a bit incomplete. I cite Anil's view of Uber, which is a buyer and seller, they can't find each other. They can't set their own prices. So it's, it's neat that Uber has an economist, but that economist doesn't actually know what a marketplace is or would let the drivers determine their own rates and what routes they want to run, et cetera. I, I guess it, I'm, I'm still reeling from you provoked a lot, but I want to know your thoughts on what our mechanism is for actually changing the rules Great questions. Do you have any answers in, in that space? Because yeah. that seems to be the thing that we're not doing. And the yeah. people who have the power don't really have an incentive to let the rest of the people in to start mucking around with their algorithms, mucking yeah. around with their economic rules. Well, a lot of people, first of all, think that these systems are so powerful. And, and yes, they are powerful. But I, I do think that the very first thing that we have to do, and what I'm really calling for, is a set of beliefs about a different future. Because, uh, and actually it was interesting, I read a review of uh, a Rutger uh, Bregman's uh, Utopia for Realists, which is a really interesting book about um, universal basic income. And he actually talked about the need for non-specific futurism. You know, like when you get too specific, you're, you're typically wrong. What it is, is we need this belief that it can be different, and we need people to start searching more aggressively for what that future is. And I do think that the 
that belief is so central. I, I just sort of imagine all of the great social movements, you know, that we we honor in our history. You know, think about uh, you know the struggles for democracy over centuries. You know, I, I uh, you know I, I you know I, I like to say you know we used to all believe in the divine right of kings. You know, we didn't. And then some guy from 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 Europe said, "Hey, you know, I'm from one of those barbarian countries that sort of, you know, fought that for for, for centuries until uh, Charlemagne rammed it down our throats." You know, <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, but you think about the uh, you know the American Revolution. You know, when you know we won the American Revolution, George the Third expected George Washington to be crowned King of America. You know, and and when he didn't, the, the world was agog. You know, and it set the world on fire. And I think that we, uh, I think we may be at the point of one of those gradually then suddenly moments when we start to find new ways of, of organizing society. And it's going to happen gradually, then slowly. Um, but I also think about, you know, movements, you know, which we're still struggling with. You know, I think about, uh, uh, um, you know, the, the challenges of people of color in this country. I think about the challenges, I mean, the, the forgotten challenges of, of the genocide on which this country was based. You know, I mean, it's kind of, you know, kind of brought a little bit to the back with, with Standing Rock, but, uh, you know, there's so many issues where it's pretty clear we, we, it is struggle, but it is also we start to believe something different. And of course, we're now we're in the middle of a backlash where people are kind of going back in in some very negative directions, uh, believing things that I think will will make the world move in a worse direction. But it is a struggle for what we believe because what we believe shapes what we try to build. Hi there, my name is Dylan. Um, some of the mechanisms that you describe for encouraging incentive to, or, or yeah, encouraging uh, new incentives for solving these big uh, problems that you're outlining is allowing kind of marketization and economization of, of new zones in society, zones that have not capitulated to uh, kind of neoliberalism, finding its fingers in, in all, of our, all, of, all of the aspects of existence today. And there are, as we're seeing with healthcare in America and the problem of refugees, um, there, we are seeing that there are certain problems that are simply not suited to being solved by marketization, by incentive building, by, by, by letting um, you know, s a certain corrupted self-interest uh, create uh, opportunities. And I'm, and I'm wondering, that very, um, you know, that very capitalist mentality that that marketization can solve any problem we have. How do you respond to the to the moral and um, kind of equitable um, conundrums that that, yeah. that that poses? Yeah, I guess I would say first off that um, I think that we have this very narrow idea which we've been sold of what markets do and the natural rules of markets. You know. When you look at, for example, the period of post-war productivity, that was also our markets at work. And it was our market that was shaped actually by a very bad experience that the world had after the First World War, you know, where uh, we, we made a series of very, very bad choices. You know, the, this great war, and then the winners punished the losers. Uh, you know, the, the, basically we saw the rise of incredible inequality, until there was a crash. You know, it was this bubble uh, that happened. And then we saw this worldwide depression, and then another world war. And after World War II, you know, everybody kind of talks about, the, sure, there were structural things, you know, but we did not have to decide to rebuild Europe and Japan after World War II, but we did. That was a moral choice. It was a, it was a pragmatic choice also. And I think that kind of enlightened self-interest. You know, I, I think there's a wonderful thing. The essay that Joseph Stiglitz wrote, a uh, famous economist, uh, wrote that actually coined the term the 1%, uh, uh, actually talks a little bit about uh, this wonderful passage in Alexis de Tocqueville where he talks about the genius of the American character is self-interest properly regarded. And self-interest properly regarded means that you do look after other people. And the other thing that's really wonderful, uh, I, I recently uh, bought a book uh, called 
uh, what Adam Smith, oh, sorry, How Adam Smith Can Change Your Life uh, b uh, by Russ Roberts. I expected it to be kind of this libertarian document about the wealth of nations. And it's instead a wonderful expose of Adam Smith's other great book, in fact, the one that he wanted to be remembered for. It's called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. It's about why people uh, want to be good, why people want to be thought well of by their peers. Why, you know, why is it that people are altruistic? And I think this idea that markets are intrinsically hostile to human values is this bill of goods that we got sold. You know, I think we can build humane markets. We also have got sold a bill of goods about how the, the collective action of governments is something that we should not, you know, be trusting. And I, I, you know, I look at all the gifts that government has done. Another book I highly recommend, Mariana Mazzucato's uh, Entrepreneurial State, which is all about the role of technology in innovation, particularly in technological innovation, all the world that we live in. So I actually think that, and then I guess there is the point that our market economy is shaped by the rules and above all by this sort of optimization function that treats people as a cost. And I think if we, you know, it, and if we built a new set of rules that run our economy as opposed to uh, the rules that we re live by right now, which is maximize, you know, capital returns, uh, you know, we, we confuse the market, we say the market of real goods and services with financial markets. Uh, we reward people for speculation. You know, I mean, when Carl Icahn buys shares in Apple, that's not investment. Why does that get favored tax treatment? That's gambling revenue. You know, I mean, he basically he's trying to be gambling. He can make the stock go up. Apple didn't need any money from Carl Icahn. It's extractive. You know, we should have a punitive tax on that kind of behavior. You know, so there's all kinds of interesting ways, you know, like not like, well, should capital gains tax go up and down? You go, well, actually, 85% of the activity you know, in our markets today, our financial markets, actually our overall, you know, exchanging of money is buying and selling futures. You know, like what's the future value of a stock? What's the future value? You know, all that crazy stuff that we saw, you know, that led up to the, you know, 2009 crash. It's basically this giant gambling market. You know, and we don't even recognize that. We call it the same thing as investing in the real market of goods and services exchanged by people. And all of that money that's gone into that market could instead, you know, going back to that graph I showed earlier, that, that could have been going into higher wages, lower working hours, better conditions, um, uh, you know, uh, new kinds of benefits. You know, and you, you, it's interesting because I talked with the famous labor economist David Autor about um, universal basic income, and I said, well, are there any natural experiments? And he said, well, yeah. You know, this Saudi Arabia and Norway, you know, two countries with a lot of oil wealth. And he said in Saudi Arabia, they used it to, to you know, create a privileged elite uh, where they brought in all these guest workers who would do all the work that they thought was beneath them. Uh, not a very nice society. In Norway, everybody works. All work is valued. Everybody just works a little less. And I go, that's a society that's also a market society and one that we could be building if we actually thought about how would we design that world? Because again, we take for, you know, there's this narrative that says the world we've got is somehow natural. It's somehow inevitable that the market wants, you know, to get rid of people, to make, uh, you know, every company as cheap as possible. This is a goodness, as opposed to looking at history and going, actually, you know, generosity is actually a better, leads to a better economy. Hi. Uh, you spoke very convincingly about solving a whole host of really wicked problems. Um, and you said, you, you talked about, you know, debugging the rules of the economy. Um, but isn't something like inequality actually um, a feature of a capitalist system, not a bug? In other words, like, if you have winners, aren't there necessarily losers? Um, and I wanted to, to use that as kind of a window to sort of problematize this idea of problem solving. Do we need to revisit that concept? Because we're not talking about problems that have linear solutions or perhaps that have solutions mm -hmm. at all. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to hear your thoughts on like what that problem solving process looks like. Well, first off, I guess I would say that, um, yes, uh, there are, you know, I do think that the capitalist system, uh, any kind of competitive system does produce winners and losers. And we did have a vast experiment in, you know, everybody's equal. And that didn't work out so well. 
And so now everybody says, well, that didn't work. So, you know, now we're all in tech. Come on. Did we ever just basically try one thing, it didn't work, and then go back to the old thing? You know, we went, that didn't work. Okay, let's try something else. Let's try something else. Let's try something until we figure out what works. Why aren't we doing more experiments to figure out what works? You know, and um, so I think that the, um, uh, you know, the idea that uh, you need, you know, massive, massive inequality to drive the, the capitalist system. Now, I will say the capitalist system has proven to be incredibly powerful. That's why I showed that graph of, of rising uh, living conditions. You know, and if you go to our world and data, you'll see graph after graph that shows that. But, you know, you know, and I've had this argument with people like Paul Graham where he says, well, if I don't create billionaires, you know, it's like you're telling me I shouldn't be doing that. I go, no, I'm not. It's like, did, did Andy Grove and Gordon Moore and Bill Hewlett uh, and uh, David Packard actually say, nah, you know, unless we can come bi become billionaires, we're not going to go create Silicon Valley. You know, no, of course not. You know, it's like the returns now, you know, it's like, you know, there's some kid who builds some, uh, you know, lightweight app that doesn't amount to much who expects to become a billionaire. You know, the, the returns in our industry, the returns to Wall Street, the returns to so many uh, areas are so disproportionate to the value, and the incentives are so out of whack. And we bought that, you know, it's like, I look at my company, it's a private company. You know, I don't get that super money. There's a whole chapter in the book called Super Money, you know, about, the, you know, our aspiration to this money that's worth so, so much more than what ordinary people get. We have to stop believing that that's, you know, uh, the driver of innovation. You know, you know th there was plenty of incentive long before you got the, the, the CEOs being paid thousands of time what ordinary people uh, get. Hello, Tim. Welcome to Book Row. My nickname's Roman Cat. And when you look at healthcare, let's take, take a look yeah. at that. Uh, we started, uh, it was bi built long ago on charity, okay? Yeah. Protestant hospitals, Catholic hospitals, Jewish hospitals, and we lost our way somewhere. Yeah. Okay, we went to the first internet revolution, which was the internet of, uh, uh, the internet of information, and now we're coming into the next revolution, which a lot of people are getting involved with, uh, Bitcoin, blockchain, cryptocurrency, a lot of people are calling it the internet of value. Okay, but what a lot of people are not getting that this internet of value is not just about dollars and cents. It's about value. Mm -hmm. And there are many different types of value that can be monetized and added. And mm -hmm. taking, you know, it's like moving forward to maybe let's go back to the early days of what made, uh, started uh, healthcare. Yeah. Your comments. Yeah. So uh, when I think about healthcare, I think a lot about, um, you know, this incredible opportunity for reinvention. You know, it's pretty clear we're in the middle of amazing discoveries in genomics, in personalized medicine, in the application of AI to various kinds of healthcare problems. And if we basically do it within the context of the current system, uh, you know, yeah, we may get some cost savings, we may get some better health outcomes, but we're not really taking the opportunity to rethink the opportunity. And I, you know, again, I'm not trying to predict the future, but I do think there's a set of design principles. And one of those design principles that you see from the very beginning of, of any kind of, of uh, human technology is you augment th people to do things that were previously impossible. And when you do that, you end up you know, coming up with new uh, business processes, new ways of thinking. And when I imagine healthcare of the future, first of all, I imagine we all like the human touch you know, when, we, when we need it you know, when we're feeling scared about something in our health. Uh, you know, we've already seen a huge amount of, of evidence uh, that human interaction will lead to better health outcomes. You know, the, the whole idea of health hotspotting and being able to tell people, uh, you know, to, to identify using, uh, using data, the people who are the heavy consumers, uh, anticipate uh, and, and, and do preventative medicine with those people. You can literally imagine for, for what they call the frequent flyers in healthcare that having a personal 
health aid would A, put people to work, and B, uh, would uh, actually reduce the costs in our healthcare system. So I imagine uh, you know, a healthcare system in which we have millions of people put to work as kind of community health workers. They're upskilled with AI, you know, in the same way that, say, uh, an Uber driver can, you know, can find their way around uh, with the aid of G uh, Google Maps. Here's somebody who, you know, has, you know, again, Paul Farmer's done this without technology in Partners for Health. You know, you get community health workers that get a level of training and they work with people in the community. You go, could you imagine? How much better our healthcare system would be if we said, wow, you know, very few people need to go to the hospital. Let's go out there and, and give them the, the care where they, where they need it. And so, again, complete restructuring is possible in one of these moments. And, and the question is, you know, again, what's keeping us from getting there? And it's going to be a long process. I know people who are working on it, you know, but they're, they're doing it with this idea of, how are we going to augment workers with these new capabilities so that they can deliver better service? I think the same thing true in education. And one of the quotes I have in the book is this uh, line from Hal Varian, Google's chief economist. And he talks about something that, you know, first time I heard it, I thought, oh my God, this is, this is the worst thing, the worst of Silicon Valley. The statement is, if you want to understand the future, just look at what rich people do today. You know, and you go, oh man, that sounds like, you know, something right out of the valley, right? But think about it for a minute. You know, it's like rich people used to go on the grand tour of Europe. You know, if you've you know flown on ever flown on Ryanair, you now know you can you can fly for twenty nine bucks. You know, and soccer hooligans follow their teams all over all over Europe. You know, so clearly been democratized. Um, maybe some you know other other uh, uh, side effects of that, but. Um, <laughs> uh, fabulous uh, piece called uh, Among the Thugs by Bill Buford that talks about soccer hooligans in Europe. <laughs> uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, you know, when I imagine what do rich people do today that I wish would be democratized, and I go, well, uh, they send their kids to schools, uh, you know, with a high uh, teacher-student ratio, you know? So I go, wow, you know, we say, you know, there's nothing left for people to do. I go, yeah, all we have to do is give everybody the same kind of education that rich people get today, you know, with small class size. We put millions of people to work as teachers. Uh, we would have way better educational outcomes if, if everybody, you know, in the world had a teacher and a mentor, and that teacher was augmented with all this knowledge and the best tools, you know, of, of, of AI. And, you know, again, you know, people like Neil Stevenson wrote about this, you know, a uh, uh, long time ago. But just think about that. You know, it's like, why aren't we doing that? You know, and, and I think it's because we built, we've designed a market system that's doing the wrong thing. And that's why I'm so excited in a lot of ways about this Facebook moment. Because everybody is starting to understand, and this is why data and society and your work is so important. We're in this moment where we can see that we're designing systems that don't always do what we meant them to do. You know? And we're seeing that they're teaching us, they're, they're become a mirror for our collective behavior and our collective beliefs. And I think that's why it's such an opportunity for us to understand that our society is framed by all these choices that we make in these systems. And I'm trying to extend that thinking from the world of technology where we can all see it to the world of economics and policy where we think that it's just natural. Oh, actually, uh, you, yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks for being here. Thank you. So, I've spent the last five years in Silicon Valley, I had some kind of history with the culture before that. And then previous to that, I did a lot of activism, social justice, and public health work. And one thing that I have been thinking about a lot lately is the kind of emerging political identity in Silicon Valley. I think to some extent, it's had a little bit of a separationist <laughs> sense about it. I don't know if you would agree, mm -hmm. but to me, it feels like a little bit of the perspective that you're outlining in your book, it feels a little bit political, for lack of a better phrase. And it makes me curious about whether there are political threads that you see happening in the Valley right now that you're excited about, particularly in regards to kind of concrete outcomes, like specific amounts of money being donated, specific initiatives, that kind of thing. Um, it seems like the industry is really in a crucible moment right now. You mentioned Facebook. 
And it seems like there's a big opportunity to figure out what the new identity of tech is going to be and how it's going to respond. Yeah. And I think that leaders like you have an opportunity to shape that, but um, it feels a little bit like the questions that you're, that you're posing here are very big picture. So I'm sort of asking you what it would mean to you to bring it down to the small picture a little bit. Like what are the donations? Who are the candidates? What are the, what are the political parties? What sort of organizations would you support? Like, what do we do today and tomorrow and this week, not just, yeah. like, over our lifetimes? Yeah, no, I understand. Um, I guess I would say I, I can't make recommendations on uh, political, I mean, specific candidates. I, I, I think that probably the biggest thing that I would say is we have to stop, um, you know, choosing from the set menu. You know, I, I, I would love to see candidates who break from the orthodoxy of, you know, well, I'm on this side of the line or I'm on that side of the line. And I'm hoping that we're reaching, you know, one of those breaking points where people realize that, you know, this sort of party line, this goes always goes with that and this always goes with that is just wrong, you know, and we start getting new candidates who are willing to espouse fresh ideas. And I do think that we have actually seen, you know, it's the one, if there's one positive thing that I can say about what happened with Donald Trump is uh, he kind of broke what's called the Overton window. You know, it's this concept of uh, certain things were acceptable to talk about or to do in politics. And he kind of just kind of blew, blew it away. And so now maybe there can be a discussion where people can come in and it's not just going to be, well, you know, we're going to go from your team to our team and back, you know, and that we can start to make uh, a new politics. And so I, I guess I would just say look for candidates who are thinking fresh ideas. I do think that there are, uh, you know, people who are starting to engage with ideas like, uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, just for example, on the benefits. You know, the, the, I think about, uh, and I talk about this in the book, uh, you know, how systems like Uber and Lyft have, have caused us to question whether the idea of W-2 versus 1099, for example, as a means of worker protection is broken. You know, or whether we go, well, heck, if we can track all these workers and we can manage their hours, why can't we just track and manage benefits, social benefits, so they track the person rather than the job? You know, why are we hung up on, the, on this old industrial notion that you work for one employer and your benefits get routed through them? You know, all the stuff we're fighting with over health care is, is kind of a new policy pres prescription. We're starting to really talk, uh, you know, universal health care in this country. And, you know, I see that uh, on, you know, so again, that would be something I'd, I'd, I'd look for as a, you know, for me, if there's an interesting litmus test issue, there are things, you know, things like that. You know, it's like, how are we going to get to that? How are we going to do it completely differently than the way we did it before rather than little tweaks? Uh, you know, and again, I, I don't know that uh, I see, uh, I mean, we also have some, you know, some very uh, urgent issues just around, uh, you know, the direction of our politics, uh, you know, where you've got one party that's really trying to entrench itself uh, through gaming the ballot box, you know, gerrymandering and so on. And I think we really, you know, in a lot of ways, I think we just have to, um, we have to break that. But, uh, and, and, you know, I, I'm not a political strategist. I don't know what races are the ones that are going to be the ones to really tip. I know that there are people like Reed Hoffman who's spending a lot of time thinking about, about that. And, uh, you know, I think there's also a lot of um, uh, you know good thinking going on in local communities. I mean, one of the things my wife Jen Palka is here, uh, and uh, she runs something called Code for America, which is involving tech people in working uh, with you know actually making government programs work better, because that's again something we can do from the tech industry. How do we actually uh, you know improve services for all the people of this country? You know, we've had this narrative that government is bad, partly because government services are, are sort of stuck in the last century. And then uh, there's a whole set of people who are trying, well, just let's just get rid of them, as opposed to, no, let's, let's actually make them better. You know, it's kind of like uh, as if we said, well, we all, we all hate Windows, so let's just, you know, stop using computers. You know, maybe, maybe we would have been better off. But, <laughs> uh, you know, instead we kind of built the Internet. And... Uh, I think that the uh, the opportunity is to, is again you know reinventing government. Um, so I'm I'm not primarily a politics guy, you know, even though this is a political agenda. Hi, thanks so much, Tim, and congratulations on the release of the book. 
Um, I, my name is Mary Madden. I'm a researcher here at Data and Society. I had a question um, that relates to one of the sort of um, big pieces of your puzzle that um, I'm guessing you touch on in the book, but you didn't mention in your talk, which is the role of the advertising industry in fueling the growth and innovation in the tech economy. And um, you mentioned that one of your sort of key um, asks for companies is to try and to create more value than they capture. And I wondered if you could speak a little bit about how advertising um, can seek to create more value than it captures yeah. um, in, in that frame. Well, you know, I, I feel like uh, there was a breakthrough, you know, in... Uh, you know, around the turn of the millennium, with um, uh, you know, with with Google's ad auction, you know, with the, you know, when when Larry and Sergey's initial moral repugnance against the model of advertising, uh, you know, was no, we want to make advertising that people will want to click on in the same way that they click on search results, that, that they'll they'll get what they're looking for, you know, and and Google uh, really built something remarkable that did, I think, create a lot of value even through advertising. I think they gradually, you know, came to turn to the dark side, you know, because like every other company, they are ultimately subject to the master AI, which is the market that says thou must continue to grow and increase your profits, uh, you know, or, or you won't keep getting this super money that we give you, uh, that we, you know, bestow on you as a result of, of doing that. And, um, I think that uh, um, you know that's a really interesting way that advertising you know has has helped. I, I think that we then kind of have gone down the path where I think what I see almost always with new technologies is they start out there's a lot of good things and then we start loading in more and more and they start going down the wrong path and now we've kind of gone to this model of advertising as addiction, <laughs> you know, uh, and how do we create addictive experiences and Silicon Valley needs to get off of that. I mean, seriously. And, uh, I, uh, you know, and, and we are starting to see the revolution against that. Um, you know, it's going to be a long, a long haul though. And I don't think it will really happen until we come up with something new and compelling, uh, in a different way. But we're already seeing, you know, that, that, you know, uh, we're starting to rediscover the value of subscription businesses, for example, where people pay for what they want. You know, uh, that, that advertising-driven news media was part of the problem. I mean, people like to point the finger at Facebook, but hey, you know, our, our uh, you know, our, our newspaper journalism uh, started to get its spine back when it actually saw it could actually get subscribers who cared about them doing real reporting as opposed to having to chase, uh, you know, the story in order to get the most clicks. Uh, and I think you know business models do matter. And actually, I, I actually I didn't actually put this in the book, but I've been uh, I have a separate talk that I give about business models, in which I, for example, contrast. You know, even though Google and Facebook both have ad business models, you know Google's original ad business model is actually very different from Facebook's. And a business model, uh, you know, we need to get below the level of well, it's just advertising. I do think that there's you know there's incredible opportunities in a lot of businesses. Uh, to complete, there's going to be breakthroughs like uh, Google AdWords uh, in areas like insurance. Uh, you know, for example, I think that the you know the natural business model of big data and the Internet of Things is actually uh, insurance. You know, because you you actually have so much more knowledge uh, that uh, you you're not sort of measuring risk in the same way. And there's going to be some really interesting breakthroughs. And again, they should be based on this idea of how do you create more value using the deeper knowledge that you have rather than how do you extract more value? I'm happy to close this up. I think we're no, running no, no. on, yeah. Hi, thanks. I'm, I'm still sort of stuck up on your um, first or second slide about the Luddites and thinking about them and that as a metaphor for now. So I know yeah. it's not a perfect metaphor, but you know, um, first of all, there's, you're making a very nuanced argument and um, I'd like to know how that doesn't come across as just smash the looms up. That's kind of interesting. Like there's, there's a misinterpretation there. Oh, sorry. Is that, is that, is that better? Yeah. So I was saying, how do we, um, how do we make it so that the, the 
the, this nuanced argument doesn't come across as just like smash the looms up like the Luddites, like mm-hmm. people think they are now. Yeah. Um, but also there's an interesting thing in that metaphor, which is that the, the Luddites campaign was talking about regulating and unionizing and giving rights to workers about a technology that fundamentally everyone, including the government, could understand like really well. You could just figure out this is a loom, it does weaving faster, whatever, you know. Um, governments can't really understand most of the technology that we're talking about today. Technologists can, but governments can't. So how do you get that regulatory framework that can, I don't know what they do, but how do they even have an informed opinion about this? Yeah, you know? yeah I, 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 I do agree. I, I will say that I'm not convinced that everyone uh, you know, in government could understand that in those days. I, I don't think that people understood you know, just where that was going. I mean, if they had, it would have gone forward much faster. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, you know, again, I, I think we overstate uh, our understanding or lack of understanding. You know, if you look at actually the evolution of those uh, machines, it took 40 years for them to get to uh, 40, 50 years from the first ones to get for them to get to a mature state, they were not that well understood, you know, any more than our, you know, and and I am quite convinced that there were, you know, uh, you know, landowners who were like, you know, I don't, you know, buy these newfangled things. I don't understand them. I don't, you know, uh, so it, don't don't uh, overestimate the complexity of today's technology relative to the technology of the past. And don't underestimate how long it takes. I mean, again, I, I look at, for example, the early, you know, the spinning jenny as equivalent to, you know, Apache 1.0, you know, or whatever. You know, it, and, and you see all this 30, 40, 50 years, and now we're kind of getting to the full, you know, factory. You know, uh, of Lowell, Massachusetts, 1840. You know, that's like almost 100 years after the spinning jenny. You know, when the fully, first fully integrated factories, and, and, you know, and here we are, we're, we're, you know, we're 35 years into the World Wide Web, you know, 50, 60, you know, years into the, you know, the widespread, you know, d- democratization of computing. And, you know, uh, it, it actually, you know, it's, it's about on schedule. <laughs> so. Yeah, oh, oh, Jen, well, actually, here, uh, you want to say, uh, she wants me to say, I mean, make I mean, this I point. Cl- I'm going to close this up first. Okay, all right. I'm recognizing we're out of time, but I want to close with one question for you. This is a room full of people who, for all intents and purposes, are debuggers, right? Yeah. Cultural debuggers, socio-technical debuggers. We look at the dynamics of technology and society, and we think about all of the things that have and can go wrong. What's your ask of us? What's our responsibility in light of your call for thinking about the ideal world when most of us spend a lot of time thinking about all of the things can go wrong. What should we be doing other than just getting idealistic? Well, I, I think the first thing that I would suggest is uh, don't um, just point fingers. I mean, I think it's really easy for all of us uh, to identify people to blame. And, and I see, you know, for example, right now there's a lot of Facebook blame. Uh, and I, I like to think of technology as a mirror that's helping us to understand ourselves better. And you know, yes, we are debuggers, and we should share what we learn in a spirit of, uh, 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 you know, of, of improving the world through more clarity. And that's kind of what we're working on. And I, I guess I, I just I feel like there's no magic bullets. Uh, yeah, I do want to answer the thing that I know Jen was wishing I would say, uh, which is education really matters. You know, I mean, the fact is, you know, government uh, does have to understand technology better. People, we do need people, uh, you know, in, uh, you know, I mean, that's one of the things that, you know, I know she works on is how do you get more people like you into public service so that we don't have that degree of, of ignorance of technology in um uh, you know, in the in the parties, you know, in the places where the decisions are being made. Um, but I, I think, uh, you know, so I guess I would just say, you know, one of the things that I would urge all of you to do is, in fact, uh, to go into positions where you can influence this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much.